Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Tim Dillon Show. We are here Saturday night for you every week, Saturday night or Sunday morning, whenever you are coming across this broadcast. Um, I'm watching my friend's bulldog. My friend got, uh, he had a baby. He had a baby and he texted me and said, are you in LA? And I was, cause I was performing at Whitney Cummings, uh, stand-up show that she had in her driveway. We'll talk about that in a moment. And um, I had said I would do it. I said I'd take the dog when you had a baby. I said, when the when the baby comes, I'll take the dog. You don't think anyone's going to actually remember these things you say, but you say them in the hopes that people will forget about them and then disappear from your life. But uh, because that didn't happen, I had to honor my commitment so he is here, and we will bring him, uh, we'll get him on screen eventually, but uh, we're going to just, so we, we we may have to just, you may see us, our eyes darting around the room, because these bulldogs, is like a little hippopotamus. Mm -hmm. It's like a, a little pig, and uh, it just uh, destroys everything. I mean, they can't procreate, they can, they can barely breathe, they can't walk. I mean, it's it's uh, amazing. And I was on the phone with Ray Comp, Ray Comp's like, that's a pig. I'm like, What? You're like, that thing's disgusting. Put it down. <laughs> what do you think people say about you? By the way, I, I want to say, and I don't always, you know, people sometimes notice something I'm in that's not this show. Um, and I and I and I appreciate that. You know, I don't announce all of my projects and the things I do here, but sometimes there are fans uh, of me that will recognize me and go, hey, you were in that. You know, I was on the Danny uh that show with uh, the rapper, Why Am I Blanking? Oh, you I played were Danny the, Brown? Danny Brown. I played Peeper the Telescope right, yeah. on the Danny Brown. Get off the bed. Don't fuck with the book. Shit. And just get he's him. Gonna rip that open. Yeah, he's going to rip it open. Just move the book, please. I mean, just relax. Just stop doing everything you're doing. Just let him on the bed. Ben, just let him on the bed. Let him sleep. Danny Brown, I played Peeper the Telescope. And it was a great honor to do that. I liked Danny Brown a lot. It was a funny, it was a funny show. The dialogue was funny. Um, and now people have noticed me uh in the new Netflix film Cuties. And it's been an honor to be in that. And it's just such a, a real treat. I am one of the cuties, and I play a young woman who is being exploited sexually. And uh, people are in arms about it. They're up in arms about it. Uh, I've not seen this. Kurt Metzger, my friend, I was talking to him last night, and he said this is an intersectional car crash because you have uh, a woman of color director who's trying to, I guess, shed light on the idea that young girls are being exploited sexually. But how did they shed light on the idea that young girls were being exploited sexually? By sexually exploiting young girls. So supposedly the last scene in this film is so disturbing and such clear like bait for pedophiles that it's so absurd that there's like, nationwide campaigns, cancel Netflix. People are canceling Netflix, which I thought I saw cancel Netflix. I said, yeah. I have to do a Jenny Slate. But no, it's, the, <laughs> it's cuties. I'm kidding. Love Jenny and the whole uh, squad. Um, but cuties, have you seen cuties? I have not seen it yet. I You're lying. It. I have. You've been watching cuties. <laughs> that's a real sick. By the way, how sick is it? Like, that's the real fucking, somebody calls you and they're like, <laughs> hey, I, uh, I found a movie on Netflix that's great. You might want to check it out. What's it called? Cuties. By the way, the name sounds like a dark web CP website. Yeah, yeah. Cuties. And the marketing for the thing is not good. Like, the marketing for it is not. Like, we're shedding light on the issue of exploitation of minors. The marketing for it is like, look at these bitches twerk. That's the problem. The problem is the marketing is like, it's female empowerment. Yes, queen. I'm 11 years old and here's my pussy. And it's like, whoa, whoa. I mean, the marketing for this 
is out of control. Why does that girl in the back kind of look like Val Kilmer? The point is this. Terrifying. This is not appropriate. Get it off the screen. Just show it for a minute. We don't want to have this. Let's not have that be the backdrop, please. (laughs) God only knows. The point is that people are angry justifiably at cuties. Shapiro, Ben Shapiro had a good take on it where he was like, the message is getting lost kind of in the marketing of the film. Mm -hmm. Because I think the marketing of the the, the, you have so many different, you know, buzzwords here going on. It's like female empowerment and then also like exploitation. So it's like you have these young, scantily clad minors in doing very sexually suggestive dances Mm. on Netflix. This is the set is about to come down. The set is about to come down. Are you? Hold on. I'm going to get him. Hold on. This is the producer of Cuties. This is why he's trying to destroy the show. Stand up. Now sit. Sit. Please sit. Sit down. Sit. Have you seen cuties? Is this why you're trying to destroy the show? Do you have any respect for anything? When he first met Oscar, Oscar really tried to fuck him up. And Duncan didn't understand because Duncan didn't understand. He didn't understand that there was evil in the world until he met Oscar. And Oscar just tried to attack him for absolutely no reason. And Duncan's just trying to... Duncan, Duncan, it's a podcast. I mean... What is the history of this dog? Like these dogs, how do they even come about? It's so crazy. But what the point here is that cuties is uh, are really getting people angry. Mm-hmm. I have not seen it. I don't really plan on seeing it. I don't plan on seeing cuties. Duncan, you're a cutie, are you? Now he's fucking up the sound. You can't do this, Duncan. 9-11 just came and <laughs> passed. Duncan, what do you think about 9-11? All right, you have to get down now. You have to get down. Oh, God. He's such a monster. Hold on, hold on. Get him down. Say goodbye to everyone, Duncan. We got to talk about 9-11 now, Duncan. He's so heavy. He's so incredibly heavy. Everybody, you know, this girl I'm friends with on Facebook, she put a a photo of Donald Trump up holding a flag, and she goes, two days after 9-11, she goes, he'll always get my vote. He's always put America first. And you're like, well, if that's all we need to do to secure your vote is to hold up a flag on the roof of a building two days after a national tragedy, well, then that's... Ah, he'll never not get my vote. Even if he serves two terms and he wants to serve another one, he'll get my vote because he held a flag up after 9-11. By the way, one of the funniest things ever that I've ever seen, there was this tour guide who was like this old, bitter guy. And he was just an angry guy when I was a tour guide in New York City on those double-decker buses. Mm -hmm. And it was the anniversary of 9-11 and he got on the bus and like a British couple had asked about the heroism of the firefighters. Like they went, it must have been an amazing day. Maybe they were Australian. I'll never get these raw. Some are British and then some come out Australian. But let's say they were from the land down under. And he was like, well, it was real heroes that day. And the guy's response was the best I've ever heard. He goes, he goes, that's all a lie. He goes, I was downtown. I saw those buildings fall and the cops and the firemen, he goes, they ran the other way. (laughs) He goes, no one ran into those buildings. He goes, I watched it. He goes, so you can believe whatever lie you want. He goes, nobody was running into those burning buildings. They were running away. They were cowards. I swear, the whole bus was just frozen. They didn't know what to do. 
The guy goes, they were cowards. They were running away. And the guy was like, oh. He was just staring, like some Australian guy was just staring at him like, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'd never heard that. And then, and then he said to me, this guy, I was training and he, on, on his bus, you know, and then he said to me, he goes, he goes, he goes, I'm not lying. He goes, they ran away. And I'm like, wasn't there. I was in Miss Rice's history class in Holy Trinity Diocesan High School in Hicksville, New York. I was sitting there next to a woman named Kate Butler, who now has another name. She was, and I had asked her for a pen or a pencil because I always didn't bring a pen or a pencil to school. That was my thing. I never, I always said for four years, I said, do you have a pen? Do you have a pencil? Do you have the homework? You know, mm -hmm. what book were we supposed to read? I, I, I could never handle it. I just was never prepared. I did not go to school prepared. Okay. Unlike this show, which has so much preparation, <laughs> so much show prep. I mean, hours and hours and days and days of preparation for this program. But I turned around to Kate and I said, you have a pen. And before I knew it, I, and I, uh, my, the teacher was called out of the room. She was brought back in. And then there was, she said there has been a attack. There was an attack on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. And back then we didn't, you know, the World Trade Center had been bombed already. So we didn't even put it together that that was a huge deal. And then the uh, Pentagon was the one that made me go, wow, this is war. Because the Pentagon, you knew. It's like, you know, this is the civilian command center, the military, civilian, and you know, this is the this is the big one. They're hitting the Pentagon. So so I was sitting there and I was in Miss Rice's history class and I heard that. And the first thing I screamed out in the class, I said, inside job. <laughs> they said, What? I said, it's an inside job. Don't you see that? I didn't even know what happened, but I just instinctually said, it's an inside job. And then I just started screaming, there are no planes. <laughs> and what was strange is I didn't even know that there were planes. He's trying to fuck the chair. Do you see what he's trying to do? He's trying to fuck the chair right now. He's just trying to, he's trying to fuck the chair. Does 9-11 get you horny, Duncan? I screamed, there were no planes. It was sad. You know, one of the kids I knew in school, his dad died. Really, a lot of people's parents. I called my dad so quick. I'm like, are you a Windows of the World? <laughs> He's like, no. What? I'm home. I'm like, all right, see you later. How great would that, how great would it be to lose a parent in 9-11? Let's stop pretending that wouldn't have been the greatest moment of your fucking life. Hey, how's Pete Davidson doing? Pretty fucking good. He's not sitting here trying to keep a bulldog off his set. I'd tuck, I'd strap both of my parents into the seats of United 93 if I could have a tenth of his career. So let's cut the shit. Candlelight vigils? Where'd mommy go? I don't know. Bin Laden took her. Where's my movie? I'm sitting here for years, week after week. Brilliance. Brilliance. But I, because I don't have a parent that died... I'll melt my parents right fuck now. Judd Apatow, email me. <laughs> Stop. He agrees. He's barking at the box of Magic Spoon. He's barking at the Magic Spoon. Why? Because you realize it's a keto cereal? <laughs> Is that why? Because it simulates the experience of the sugar cereals you liked as a child? <laughs> Is that why you're barking? Enough with the the, the 9 11 uh, 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 porn memorabilia. Oh, yeah. Can we stop? That day we were all Americans. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks a lot. You know, that day we were all Americans. That day we were all Americans. That, yes, and the day before, that too. And the day after that. But thank you for making that brilliant point. There was a lot of unity in the early periods after 9-11. I've discussed it on this show. There was a lot of unity in the early periods after 9-11 in this country, but that evaporated pretty quickly. And we wanted it to. You don't want a country. You don't want a cult. You don't want to live in a cult. How are you doing? 
How weird would that be? Shut up. How weird would it be if you just walked around and everybody was in... Co- Get them out of the room. Get them out of the room now. Now you're out. Now you're out. Because you can't handle the responsibility. Send them out, please. You leave now. We're discussing 9-11. You have a little respect. Put them in the kitchen, please. My point is that you don't want to live in a constant funeral. And all these people that are just glorifying the immediate aftermath of 9-11 as if it's the goal, as if that's the goal, to walk around with your head bowed, thinking about your own mortality every minute of every day. It's not the goal, by the way. And it was nice for a few days. A couple of vigils are nice, but you don't want to live in a vigil. So can we stop, please, romanticizing this idea? I don't like where we are now, clearly. We've gone off the rails quite a bit, culturally, in this country. But this idea that everything has to be right after 9-11, when it was so nice, it was nice for a few days. I'm just sick of all these people on Facebook being like, well... We were all Americans that day. People love talking about other heroic people. People love that. They, lo- they think it makes them heroic by talking about other people that were heroic. You know? Remember the heroes. You know? I'm just saying, I would have been willing to sacrifice more than I sacrificed in 9-11 which was very little. I would have been willing to sacrifice more. And I think it's important that we all remember that. You know? So that's my little commentary on 9-11. It changed New York dramatically. And I I put something up on Instagram about this. If you knew about New York City before 9-11, it changed New York dramatically. It made New York a victim. It made New York vulnerable. And then, you know, New York was this tough city that it it was not nearly as uh, criminal- as it had been, it was getting safer, but it was a tough city. And then it became, you know, uh, about um, Midwestern tourists coming to save New York City. That's when you had the Disney on Broadway start. Tourists were coddled and catered to. And it became a city that was very specific. It made it into a very general city where everybody can enjoy it. It is what it is. Eventually, it... um, You know, all the restaurants in New York City, uh, a lot of them were French. And a lot of fine dining or uh, luxury uh, was very opulent in the 90s. It was very frilly. There was a lot of lace and big tablecloths and banquettes. I mean, it looked very like you were eating in uh, Versailles. And then after 9-11, that felt inappropriate. That felt wrong. And then the green market movement started. And, you know, all these restaurants kind of made themselves look half done. There was exposed brick and steel and pipes. And it just, you're more connected to your environment than you had been. You wanted to eat on a wooden table and things were real. And it it really changed New York City. If you you knew New York City pre-9-11, many of you don't. But it really did change New York City. You could take that down, but you could, you could read that if you have any interest in it. Um, um, but it was, it was very interesting in the aftermath of 9-11. And I'm starting to see a lot of overlap between that and, and Corona, a little bit, a little overlap between that and Corona. The, the constant terrorizing of the public has become unfortunate. But it was called by me and other people on the show who said this is real. This did happen. Uh, 9-11 happened. And it will be used as a way to constantly terrify people and to uh, achieve aims that possibly were being planned long before that event, like Corona, like COVID. So when you have uh, Dr. Fauci, who cannot throw a baseball, go out and tell everybody that we have to hunker down for the winter. We have to hunker down for the winter. Let Listen to this guy. We should hunker down. We could see a very deadly December. We need to hunker down this fall and winter. It's not going to be easy, says Dr. Fauci. I'm telling you right now, folks, we're getting to a point now where you're going to start, you're going to have to start making your own decisions about your own life, your own ability to earn money, 
And the experts are so all in the pocket of somebody. Everybody is in the pocket of somebody and they have an interest in you believing certain things and they have an interest in you walking around um, and not questioning them. And I'm not saying that you should go out there and, and be willy nilly and start, you know, taking all kinds of chances with your health. But I am telling you that I don't know how many young people this is killing. I don't know that. I don't know. I believe that this is still the vast majority of people that are dying from this disease are elderly and many of them may have other conditions. That is still what people are able to treat this disease a lot better now. And I just don't know if we should constantly be, uh, you know, hunkered down. We hunkered down for four months. And then as Roseanne said, people left their house when they were ready to kill. The great Roseanne, I did a podcast with the great Roseanne, an epic meeting of the minds. A legend such as herself and uh, myself having uh, a, a conversation or something that would, would get close to that. And I was uh, very honored that she spoke to me. She's uh, so funny. She's effortlessly funny. And uh, she makes some very good points. And then she's kind of in and out of it as well. She's getting older. She said she was close to 80. She's 67. I mean, she's not, she's nowhere near 80. But what did you think? Did you enjoy the Rosanna? She's such a legend. She's so, I was crying off to the side, just laughing. She's very, very, very funny, funny, man. She's incredibly funny. And uh, it's well worth a watch. Hey, do you take some DMT before that? Yeah, sure. Before that interview, yeah, yeah. You take, uh, you drink some ayahuasca before you watch me and her, yeah, yeah. I think it's a good primer for that conversation. You might uh, put a little tab of acid under the tongue before before you hit play on that one, because it is a little wild, but it is well worth a watch. Very honored to do that with uh, the great Roseanne. What is an appropriate gift, by the way? Now that my friend had this kid. What's an appropriate gift? Should I get him what I got you and uh, Katie for the wedding? Ben is angry at me. But Ben is, he's, he doesn't believe that I sent him and his wife a beautiful wedding present that was lost in the mail because of COVID-19. <laughs> it was lost in the mail because of COVID-19. It, I won't even tell him what it was like because I don't want him to be so upset. And because if I told him what I got him, he would be so sad for doubting me, he would then, like, you know, who knows, offer to just work on this show for free for the rest of his life. Because he would be so indebted to me just because of what I got him that was lost in the mail uh, due to uh, coronavirus. We, we cannot find it. We don't know where it is. So, but I don't know. Do you get a savings bond? Can you get that? What do you get? Oh, you could do that, like a mutual fund. Do you invest fund? in this country, though, for the kid? Or do you buy him something from China? Because we're on the way out. What's the savings bond in this country going to be worth soon? Do you really give a kid a bond and say, cash it in went right when you're about to go to college right. when you can't breathe anymore? <laughs> I'm ready to no longer leave the house, aren't you? See, in California, we've been getting ready to just not leave anymore. Because when you leave, there's ash and embers of dead trees in your throat. So you can't go anywhere. And the outside has now just become a hindrance for the inside activities you want. Like you just can't get on the Wi-Fi because right. the fucking everything outside's burning and you're getting angry. <laughs> and cell phone towers are up in flames. So the outside now, it's just annoying. The outside world's annoying. And that's why we're all going digital. We're all going to go into the void eventually. And we're going to communicate with each other digitally. We're not going to leave our homes. We're going to get, you're going to get Amazon food deliveries. You're going to have uh, uh, pedophile Netflix. And you're going to have, uh, you know, whatever you want. And you're going to be okay. You're not going to want to leave. You're going to go, this is fine. This is fine because, you know, what's the other option? You're going to go outside in a full hazmat suit? Doesn't make any sense. I'm so ready for that. I'm so ready to just be in a, in a, in a good quadrant. I hope I'm in a good quadrant when they divide the country up into quadrants based on resources. 
which will happen soon, like District 9. Remember that movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just hope I'm in the good district. I forget which one that is. But that's all coming true. The Hunger Games and District 9. All those teeny bopper movies will come true eventually. And, you know, AOC will be one of the queens and she'll walk around, you know, with a scepter. And, you know, you'll be like, oh, she's from the, you know, she's District 12 or whatever. Right. I mean, that's all happening. That's all going to happen. Just embrace it, you know? It's really bad in California, man. I've never seen it this bad. When you go out now. Never have. Never have. You're just breathing in. It's like a campfire in your car. You're breathing in this air. It's really, truly a problem. And then, of course, everybody needs to virtue signal on social media with all their, their photos of, like, the red skies. And like, I guess we should have listened to that climate change. I was like, yeah, I, I guess so. But maybe it's too late now, so maybe uh, shut up. It's too late. It's too late. It's too late. You're literally on fire. So what does it matter? I'm glad you scored that point. Glad you scored that point. Well, I guess we should. <laughs> is that the last thing you want to do before you check out is to score a point? Score a political point? Like the last breath of, of, of fucking unsafe oxygen you breathe on this earth should be used to get the better of somebody? Who hell, I guess I'm... What an American way to go. Just trying to best somebody in a pointless online argument right before you go. Magic Spoon, baby, you know me. I love the sugar cereals. Hard to kick the sugar. Very tough. Sugar in the carbs. Addict, addict, addict. Releases that dopamine in your brain. Not a lot makes you happy. Sugar makes you happy. You think about when you were in a kid, when you were a kid, you didn't want to fucking eat raisin bran. You wanted lucky charms. Count chocula. The real shit. You know? Fruit Loops, you wanted good shit. Waffle Crisp, Apple Jacks, fucking everything. You wanted sugar cereals, okay? And you still want them as an adult. But I'm telling you that you can get a cereal that's exactly like the ones you love that has zero sugar, 11 grams of protein, and only three net carbs in each serving. If you were on a keto diet and you want to take a meal out of your day and eat a bowl of high-protein cereal, keto is very tough, very hard to plan. If you're on the go, it can be incredibly difficult. Here's the way you can do it. They have four flavors. Cocoa, fruity, frosted, and blueberry. It tastes amazing. Honestly, too good to be true. It's keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, GMO-free. Okay? I love the fruity flavor. It tastes exactly like Fruit Loops. So if you want to simulate a bowl of Fruit Loops, it's a great no-guilt dessert. It's a meal replacement. It's a great breakfast. It's a way to give yourself a high-protein, low-sugar, low-carb snack. No sugar, sorry. Low-carb, no-sugar snack. It works well within the keto diet, especially if you're not doing any other carbs or things that day. It's only three net grams of carbs. So if you're on a, a high-protein diet, this is really the move. If you go to magicspoon.com slash Tim Dillon to grab a variety pack and try it today, and if you like the show and you want to support us and you want to get a good cereal with no sugar in it, this is the way to do it. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. If you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. Magic Spoon is really good. They send me it all the time. I eat it. It's good. I like it. I wouldn't lie about that. And it is good. You know me, I'm on and off diets all the time. It's very difficult to keep your weight under control, especially in this fucking country, in this economy. So, <laughs> that in this economy. What is that? Is that a, does that come from the stand-up bit? I think so. Yeah, yeah, when he's yeah. talking about strengthening up your shit pussy. Yeah. It's so good. Anyway, we would go have him on the show, but he's too far away. We're not driving nine hours for that. We're not doing Zoom with him. Um, so, I mean, we love Magic Spoon. It's great. We thank Magic Spoon for sponsoring the podcast, and we hope that you guys enjoy their zero-sugar, high-protein, low-carb cereal as much as we do. So go to magicspoon.com slash Tim Dillon, magicspoon.com slash Tim Dillon. Here's the thing. A lot of people put way too much cologne on. They mismatch a cologne to their scent. I'm telling you right now, um, you want a nice scent. That is what attracts people to each other. Pheromones, all that stuff, okay? 
So what's great about Hawthorne is you kind of design your own cologne. They ask you a few questions about you. Uh, you take a quiz, and what they have to do is they kind of design a cologne specifically for you, okay? So where you live, what you're into, what you do, all kinds of things go into this. The natural odors in the environment you're in, they basically put together a per If you've never had a personalized product, you might want to try one. Deodorant, shampoo, body wash, face cleanser, lotion, they do it all at Hawthorne. They personalize everything to you. Everybody has different needs and Hawthorne understands that. Everybody has different requirements for the products they buy. If they, if you want to achieve you know, maximum success with anything, a cream, a lotion, a potion, whatever. So if you take a quick two-minute quiz and Hawthorne tells you the two colognes that are best for you, one for work and one for play, totally risk-free, free shipping and free returns. Check out Hawthorne at hawthorne.co. That's Hawthorne with an E, H-A-W-T-H-O-R-N-E with an E, Use my promo code TIM. Get 10% off your first purchase. Hawthorne.co. I'm telling you right now, if you've not had a personalized lotion, body wash, face cleanser, deodorant, cologne, it's a game changer. Truly. This company will easily design something for you, for your skin, for your scent. And I'm telling you right now, it is very, very uh, luxurious. You feel luxurious. You feel like the king of England. You, oh, I'm the king of England, eh? That's what happens when you use this face lotion. You go, oh, I'm the king of England, and everyone that doesn't look or sound like me is a savage. <laughs> and I oh, now sound Australian again. I can never do a good Australian except when I don't want to. But I'm the, I'm the king of England because I have a Hawthorne face lotion. I'm the king of England, and I'm going to... Christianize the barbarians. So my point is that, which is which is not good, but colonization has some benefits. The point is, take the quiz, go to Hawthorne, put the lotion in the basket, right? Wasn't that what they said? Signs of the lamb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put the lotion in the basket. That's what that's why I wouldn't be in business, because if I was Hawthorne, I would I would I'd be the guy in the room that goes, if if our if our logo is not put the lotion in the bath. Like if our logo is not a uh, Hannibal Lecter and if our, uh, if our motto is not put the lotion in the basket, what is it? It puts, or it, it puts the lotion on the skin. It, it puts the lotion on itself. Or whatever. If that's not our logo, I don't want to be involved with this company. That's my deal breaker. Hawthorne.co. Use my promo code Tim to get 10% off your purchase. I did stand up for the second time at Whitney Cummings house. Whitney Cummings uh, had a stand-up comedy show in her driveway or her basketball court, really her driveway area, and uh, it was a lot of fun. You know, the all, you know Whitney knows all these uh, influencers, like these Instagram. Is the proper term hoes? Probably not. I'm kidding, ladies. But these Instagram inf well, the teats are out. Mm -hmm. I mean. They're not influencing people to go to school. They're not doing a lot of adult literacy programs, from my understanding. I'm sure they have many philanthropic endeavors. But, you know, a lot of it is the teats are out. And, uh, and they all have, like, deals, you know, they're, they're hawking body oil for millions and millions of dollars on it. It's not my demo, really. I like a working class Philly from a uh, working class family from outside of Philly. I like a working class family from outside of Philly that begrudgingly has to sit in a car together for 25 minutes. Everyone's smoking cigarettes, including the dog on the way to the show. Angry people, people that feel like they've been slighted. My audience is people that feel like they've been slighted like me because both of my parents survived 9-11. That's who my audience is. So when I look at these hot Instagram, Black Lives Matter, and, you know, all of these politically correct teats in the front row, um, I, I was like, will I do well? I don't know. But Spade was there and Whitney was there and the Booker, the comedy store was there. And some people were bombing, by the way. You never really want to bomb when you have you know, people that you respect there, but some people just, I mean, Wow. Uh, but most people doing great. Annie Letterman murdered, killed it. Very funny. But Annie's like that. She can kind of fucking bob and weave and really, you know, when you're in a weird, me and Annie came up in New York when we were in a lot of weird situations and you had to 
lend, give yourself over to that as a comedian and just go, we're in this fucked up situation, we're going to call it out. And then a lot of other comedians get up there and they're like, that, 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 that day, that day, have, have you ever been to, have you ever been? And the crowd's like, hey, we're Instagram influencers. We think with our tits. <laughs> what are you doing here? Can you fucking talk to us? Can you fucking, I don't know who these people, Olivia Munn, I don't even know who these people are. Kesha? Who, what's that? What's a Kesha? I don't even know what that is. Is that like shakshuka? Is that a, a dish? Who is this Kesha? She said hello. She goes, I'm Kesha. Like, I'm going to turn around and go, I'm a huge fan. She said that to me. I had a peach in my hand. And I go, do you think this is ripe? And I was hitting it on the counter. <laughs> She's a singer, apparently. She did that song, TikTok. TikTok. That was a song of every fat, freckled Irish beast woman who will still put it on Facebook and be like, remember Fridays and college at SUNY New Pulse with my girls? Tech talk, you know. It was every fat slob's theme song who was trying to get a cock in their ass at 3 a.m. <laughs> at a SUNY school in New York. Freckled Irish beast women would listen to that song. That is what you've inspired, Kesha, yes or yes. That is what you have done. That is what you're me. Yes, you want hot people dancing to your music, but it ain't. That's not the case. You know who loves that song? Me in a wig. Me in a wig. <laughs> and they'll still put it up on Facebook. And they go, hey, this was a song from me and my girls. Remember girls? And they tag all the other fucking hot air balloons <laughs> that they went to a SUNY school with. These fucking boats that they went to school with. I'm tagging all my girls. And then you just, you just, you <laughs> click on the, the women that they've tagged and it's just someone whose face is like, <laughs> you know the fat woman Instagram shot? I've done it many times. It's from up here. Up here, tilted head. That's fat woman Instagram. Up here, tilted head. You don't know what's going on beneath my head. I bet it's hot though. I bet it's a cauldron of pussy juice. <laughs> That's what she did, Tekka. There's a place downtown where the da 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 TikTok. TikTok, that's your heart, ladies. Kesha. And then uh, Miranda Cosgrove, who's on uh, iCarly. Mm -hmm. I don't want it a pedophile. What is this? <laughs> I don't watch these things. Nickelodeon. Drake and Josh. What are we, nuts? Where are the adults? Where's Candace Owens? Where is the exhumed corpse of William F. Buckley? I want to perform. What is Icon? Did you watch this horse shit when you were growing up? You did, didn't you? Yeah, did. Rugrats? Yeah. I didn't have dog. cable. I didn't have cable. I come from the mean streets. My parents survived 9-11. I didn't get the good shit. I didn't get the Judd Apatow movies in the cable. My parents didn't have their skin fucking melted. I like Pete. I, I don't know Pete at all. I'm not, I'm obviously, I'm not throwing any shade at Pete. I know it's sad to have your dad killed in 9 11. Sure. But let's be very honest. It, it's not worked out horribly for him. And this is the fact. So I'm willing to kill my parents. But this is what, and Kesha seemed like a lovely woman. Mm -hmm. I, they, they all were lovely women. I'm not, none of this. I just, this world is not, I don't understand this world. What is iCarly about? Oh, man, it was a spinoff of Drake and Josh, and she lived in an apartment, and she had a friend and a brother, and they just got into weird shit at school. That was kind of it. Dude, Nickelodeon sucked. The only good things were Doug and Daria. They were fucking yeah, good. Yeah. They were fucking good. Rugrats, fine. I, I would go to my friend's houses. They had cable. They had Nickelodeon. We didn't have cable. When I was a kid, I watched Melrose Place. I watched Sydney and Michael carry on a lurid affair, and Michael had a beach house in Malibu, and then Sydney blew up the whole apartment complex. And I learned words like blackmail and abortion. So I'm sorry I wasn't watching cartoon children 
you fucking pussies. Shout out to Aaron Spelling and Darren Starr. Melrose Place is fucking iconic. Shout out to Heather Lockyer. I hope you're okay wherever you are. You're probably parked on an off-ramp somewhere. But anyway, I hope you're good. <laughs> well, she's had issues is what I'm saying. I don't know. <laughs> she has. <laughs> she's probably parked somewhere on an off-ramp trying to figure out where she is. Well, we're with you in spirit, Heather. <laughs> Fuck these kids. I watched Beverly Hills 90210 and NYPD Blue. Great shows. Dennis Franz, that fat racist. What a genius. What an actor. I, and they all have this attitude. These, these hot Instagram people have this attitude. They're like, that's how they talk. They're like, I had to leave Amanda Cerny, who I don't know, has got like a trillion followers. She's got 25 million followers. Went up and start re starts reading Whitney's act out of a book. And I said, and, 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 and she's a sweet girl. You know, I'm not sh shitting on anybody here, but I said that was my time. I looked at Tom Papa. I said, I think it's time to go. Tom Papa brought a loaf of bread, which I just ate with my bare hands <laughs> in uh, Whitney's kitchen. Whitney's, uh, Whitney got some great pizza from Big Mama's Pizza. And I'd never had that. And it was just kind of like, I don't know, it's pretty good. Big Mama and Papa's Pizzeria. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. good, man. Yeah. She got cheese sticks, mozzarella sticks. You don't find a lot of mozzarella sticks in L.A. Mm -hmm. But when you got them, and what's great is I got to have pretty much all of the food because they don't eat. The Instagram influencers don't eat, okay? They don't eat. They don't eat food. It's not allowed. They take a picture with an avocado once a month, and that's all the protein they need. So I was eating, I was filling up, but of course some of the female comics are filling up too. You know, they're not exactly small, but it was a lot of fun. It was an interesting, uh, it was an interesting time. Kesha didn't show up sadly, but she was there the other day. Yeah. I kid Kesha. What do I know? She's, you know, so funny. She seems like such a mature, like almost dark brooding type of person. But then the music is like, It's like an alarm clock, her songs, right? Yeah. It's kind of like an alarm clock, yeah. but they're good. Yeah. But it's like a fun alarm clock. It's like, I'm, I'm waking up. Tick tock, tick. My life means something. That's what her music is. It's just fat women in state schools going, we're making the memories. Someone kidnap me, please. They want to get kidnapped, those women. Someone take me away. <laughs> Someone bury me under a lake. Show me that I'm special. <laughs> but I did well. I had fun. In the middle of my set, I said, oh, good, Chris D'Elia just got here. I said, he'll go next. That didn't get a big chuckle. That was, a ve that was not a warmly received joke. There was a little chill in the air, but it was a good thing. It, Whitney really loves stand-up comedy, and I think all these other women really like her because Whitney's a you know real deal comic, kind of in that boys' club of being able to really throw down. Really, written, Whitney writes her ass off. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, um, and she just fucking really does well, and her new jokes are very funny. You know what I mean? But then when she's like, all right, now we're going to have the Instagram influencers come up and do my material. And they're like, ha, ha. Kids don't get injured anymore. Have you heard that? And the Whitney's has to explain to them. She's like, well, there's the premise comes first. <laughs> Honey, the premise comes first and then the punchline. Don't, no, 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 no. Don't snort the microphone. We talk into it. <laughs> no, we talk into it. Um, but I was, uh, I was really glad that I was included. Now, and now I'm sure I won't be again. But content is king. If I've learned one thing, it's content is king. But it was very nice. And she got a lot of pizza. I didn't even know Whitney knew what food was. Because every time I'm there, she's always trying to give me like plant-based popsicles. Uh -huh. She's like, this is a, a chocolate kale pop. I'm like, what? She's like, how about some raspberry dust? I'm like, wait, what? She never has regular butter. She always has some weird butter. She's like, this is butter from a cactus's pussy. 
And I'm like, well, how about how about a cow? How about a cow's butter? I didn't even know she knew what fuck, dude. If you had said to me, Whitney's having a comedy show and she's getting food, I would have never thought that we were going to be fucking doing pizza, cheese sticks, garlic bread. How fucking cool was that? How unexpected was that? I thought we were going to be all eating like, you know, like taking one bite of a leaf and then handing it to the next person to bite it. You know? But it was good, man. We hope the comedy store reopens. We're back out on the road having a little bit of fun. We are on the road. We're going to be in Palm Beach. We're going to be in uh, in Texas. Get, get TimDillonComedy.com up. Let's see where we're going to be. I'm excited to be in some of these places. Some of them not so much. So late September the 26th, uh, we're going to be at Hyenas Comedy Club in Dallas. October 1st through the 3rd, Zanies in Nashville, Salt Lake City, Wise Guys, October 6th and 7th. Phoenix, Arizona, Stand Up Live, the 9th through the 11th of October. Tampa, Florida, Side Splitters. Really, I love that place. October 20th through Wednesday the 21st, West Palm Beach, Florida. We're going to be there October 22nd through the 24th. So if you are in Dallas, Nashville, Salt Lake City, Phoenix, Tampa, West Palm, Please grab your tickets. They do go fast. These clubs are at reduced capacity. We also have some other dates coming up, maybe Colorado and places like that. Those are places I'm very excited to go. Those are places where I believe, I don't know about the COVID numbers. Port, I just turned down an offer for Portland just because the money wasn't right. But it's like, I'm really not excited to go. I know Portland's a great comedy town, but it's like, can you just get it together a little bit over there? Can you just get it together? I don't really need to fucking, you know, what do we, what do we, we, we were riding every night now. Right. So 12 days of Christmas, like the 60 days of, of looting, 60 days of rioting. Just clean it up over there, Portland, please. I really don't like the Pacific Northwest. I, I don't jive with it at all. I'll perform there, but it's not for me. It's not for me. Those fucking gray forests and everything. Oh, fuck off. I'm, it's not for me. And if you live there, bless your heart. And I know you deserve comedy. And maybe you're a fan of the show. But I'll tell you right now, I don't, I do not connect with your area at all. I went to Spokane once, which is essentially a white supremacist. I mean, it's like, they're literally like a few miles away from this town in Idaho where everybody's like, you know, real proud of their heritage. <laughs> Got a lot of interest in European culture. And, uh, you know, I was like, wow, real white crowd. As soon as I walked onto the stage in Spokane and then everybody went, yeah. The local races I was reading, they were like, uh, Governor Butch Otter is running against, and I'm like, what are we doing here, folks? I was going nuts. I was following around a groundhog for two days. Mm -hmm. This groundhog, I kept following around. I would, I would FaceTime Ben and show him the groundhog, and uh, and then I and then I realized that a, a groundhog is the same thing as a woodchuck. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what I realized? Yeah, or maybe they're not the same, or or they are the same. Well, why don't you look it up? This is why you're here to look things up. To be to be our link to the to reality. A groundhog are also woodchucks, or a whistle pig, or a land beaver. Now that's what I learned being in, in Spokane. I learned that. I learned that a groundhog is also a woodchuck. Okay. I also learned several other things about you know genetics. But I'll, I'll leave them out. I'm also unsure of the scientific basis of much of what I was told, much of what I learned. But I, I will get back to the Pacific Northwest. I'm just not excited to go. I'm not, in, I'm not uh, really pumped up to go to the Pacific Northwest. Those pale goth weirdos. Get the fuck out of here. Express VPN. Everybody needs a VPN, a virtual private network. Why? It is... You're able to disguise wherever you are, and you're going to need that soon. The government, all these private companies are all stealing your information. They want to know what you're about. They're trying to kill you, put a chip in your head, syringe in your ass. You know the deal. Real prepper shit, but now the prepper stuff's starting to feel smart. And one of the ways you can do it is by disguising your location on the Internet. VPNs are incredibly important. Do you want to watch Cuties in Peace? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm a comedian. What I'm saying is that you can use it to use Netflix from all over the world and see, uh, you know, the great Japanese bake-off or whatever the hell's going on. 
So it, it creates a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet so your online activity can't be seen by anyone. It's as easy as closing the bathroom door. Fire up the app and click one button. Rated number one by Wired, The Verge, and CNET. It works on your phone, laptops, and even routers so everyone who shares your Wi-Fi can be protected. Secure your online activity by visiting expressvpn.com slash Tim Dillon. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash T-I-M-D-I-L-L-O-N. And you can get an extra three months free. ExpressVPN.com slash Tim Dillon. Extra three months free. I mean, that's 90 days of free fucking activity. Every I had no idea how big VPNs were. I had no you idea. You gotta have one. You gotta have a VPN. I'm using it on the laptop right now. It is so important. And also, I had no idea the, the HIVs you gotta get. So you can get an HIV and a VPN. I had no idea how, how, how prevalent those two things were. HIV now is not even a huge deal, by the way. No one cares. You, AIDS is less than COVID. You, you hope you go. You go, I hope I have AIDS. Um, so if you go, that's expressvpn.com. It's a great way to support the show. You got to get one of these anyway, and you're getting three months off. What do you care? You're not finding something else with three months off. All these motherfuckers have enough money. Help me. Expressvpn.com slash Tim Dillon, T I M D I L L O N. It is as easy as closing the bathroom door. Fire up the app and click one button. How easy is that? So easy. I mean, it's very easy. Yes or yes. ExpressVPN.com slash Tim Dillon. The Tim Dillon Show is sponsored by Manscaped. Keeping your body groomed and tidy is important. It makes you feel better. Do yourself a favor and get the right tools for the job. Get Manscaped. The only brand dedicated to below-the-belt grooming. The engineers at Manscaped created the perfect ball hair trimming system. It's called the Perfect Package, and it comes with the Lawnmower 3.0, the best trimmer on the market. It's waterproof and cordless, so you can use it in the shower. And it has a contour design that makes it easy to navigate your most sensitive area. Their proprietary skin-safe technology makes it nearly impossible to cut yourself. God, shaving so hard. As always, the Perfect Package comes with a crop preserver, an anti-chafing bowl, deodorant, and moisturizer. And the Crop Reviver, pH balance for freshness. Subscribe and get a new replacement blade every three months. Plus, get two free gifts. The Shed Travel Bag, which is a very nice bag, $39 value, and the patented high-performance reduced chafing Manscaped Boxer Briefs. This is the perfect package for your perfect package. Get 20% off and free shipping when you use the code TIMD at manscaped.com. That's manscaped.com. Use promo code TIMD for 20% off your first order. Your balls will thank you. I'm excited to go to London. I want to go to London. Let's sell out the Soho Theater. I want to go to the UK. I want to do that True Geordie podcast, that guy. I want to eat meat pies, you know? I want to eat good chicken tikka masala, which is the cuisine of London, you know? Because what well, what is it going to be, boiled meat? You know, they have that uh, Sunday roast in England. They're all talking about how good it is with Yorkshire pudding and the roast. So there's like, you know, British people would come over here and they'd be like, there's nothing better than the Sunday roast. It's just nothing better. I'm like, yeah, uh, uh, you know what's better than that? Uh, a chicken finger in my country. A mole chicken finger is better than your national dish. Shut the fuck up. You gave us a lot of great gifts like civilization, racism, <laughs> but you don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have anything going on with the food. We don't need your fucking Yorkshire pudding. And, yeah, it's just gray roast beef. It's fine. I'm sure it's good, damn good if it's done right. But they're so invested that it's the best. It's the best thing ever. It's nothing better than a Sunday roast. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say uh, combos are. I'm going to say a, a combos from a, a truck stop that you eat on the way to a national park you're going to get kidnapped in are better than your Sunday roast. Your graying... <laughs> Your gray pussy lip roast beef and your Yorkshire fucking pudding and your mashed peas grow the fuck up. And your somebody was talking to me about this and I forgot who was talking to me about it, but somebody made a great point. They were like, it might have been on another show. They were saying like, isn't it weird that Britain's big fish and chips dish is served in like newspaper and they serve it with like malt vinegar. It's very strange, you know, but they come over here. They are impressed by our food over here. That's the one thing in America really impresses people. I mean, we don't have much else going on except spectacle. We're very good at spectacle. Is that Kim Kardashian? You know, like they're all into that. Like, oh my God, that's a person from TV and they're, they're real and they're actually here. <laughs> that, that we can do really well, you know. 
But uh, food is just, re- you know, there's no, there's no more sinful food than America. Nobody lays a meal on you like America. Even Italy, you feel light and fine after you eat. But America, we poison people truly with everything we give them. Just a little bit of poison, you know? And uh, the, the people from the UK are like stunned. You go, go have a milkshake in another country from McDonald's. You're like, this is like not sweet. And then you realize that part of what makes our milkshakes sweet is the amount of syrup that goes into them. And that's why you're drinking them and you get a pounding headache about 30 minutes after you have this milkshake because you're coming down. After you have the milkshake, you're in the car, you're like, my life's going to work out. Everything's going to be okay. Frappuccino, milkshake, any of it. I'm going to be, I'm doing well. When you have a frappuccino, when you're halfway down, a Starbucks Frappuccino, when you're in the front of your car and you got the air conditioning blasting on your face and you got that Frappuccino down and you, and, you, and you got the caffeine in there and then the sugar, you're going, okay, I can do this. Whatever this is, whatever this life is, I can do it. And then 30 minutes later, you have a pounding headache because you're coming down from the sugar and you need something else. So you stuff a thing of gum in. You take a fucking energy drink. I mean, it's just a never-ending You know, so I want to get over there. I want to get over there to Australia, to the UK, and do some of those markets. I'm very excited about going to those markets. And I've never done stand-up. I've done stand-up comedy in Scotland, which was great. I went over with a mixed-race comic and an Indian woman. And then I walked out, and, like, all the Scottish people were like, oh, here's the American. Like, they were like, oh, here's the, here's the reason Trump got elected, you know? Because, like, the two comedians I went with were fairly woke. So they went out and they did, like, their woke bits. And the crowd's like, okay, this is this the American showcase? And then I went out and I was like, hey, fuck you. And they were like, yeah. And we just connected. I love that room, the stand in Glasgow. Great. I don't know what's happening to UK comedy. I imagine, like, American comedy is being pulverized into the ground by, uh, you know, non-binary fat witches running around uh, – Telling people, casting spells on people and telling them what words they're allowed to utter. I'm unsure. God, I just want to go. Can we just go back to a fucking nice time of private, kind of puritanical set? Like, sex should be private. Sex is by its nature better if it's private. You know what I mean? And and I know what you're saying. That's what Epstein thought. But I don't mean it like that. What I mean is that. By making sex just mass marketing and vulgar and nasty, what you're doing is you're taking all the interesting kind of cool stuff about it away and you're making it this transactional fucking, you know, experience that, you know, people are having less sex. Isn't it amazing? Think about that. Wet Ass Pussy is one of the biggest songs in the country. People are actually coming in contact with less wet-ass pussies in real life. They're having less sex. They're furiously masturbating to porn. They're not having a lot of sex because everything's been digital and everything's been made very sterile. Sex feels very... Have you ever met a sex addict and heard them talk about sex? When they talk about it, it sounds gross because they talk about it the way that you talk about anything you do all the time that is relatively kind of me- somewhat meaningless to you. Mm-hmm. And, and it's very a perfunctory, uh, the mechanization of it, the, the, the mechanics of it, the way they talk about it, they talk about it in a way where you go, ugh, it just sounds kind of gross. Because instinctually we know that sex should have some level of, it, should, it doesn't always have to be this special, amazing, whatever thing, but it should have something about it that is more than pissing. Sex should be more than pissing and shitting. Right. We know that. But when a sex addict talks to you about sex, it sounds like somebody's talking about taking a piss. <laughs> it does. And then I stopped behind the rest stop, and the bathroom was out, so I just took a piss around the building. Then I got back in my car, and I drank some more water. Fuck, I had to piss again. So I pissed in a bottle. <laughs> then I kept driving to the hotel room, and I pissed all over. I was so drunk, I pissed all over the fucking bed. Piss, piss, piss. <laughs> I piss in the ocean. I piss in the pool. All right. Why are you telling me? But there's something kind of antiseptic, sterile, medical, gross about that. And I feel like our society's heading to that place with sex. And it's ve- it is disturbing when you see young kids, young girls and boys 
sexualized before they are mature enough to handle the emotional, psychological ramifications of their behavior and what they're doing. You know, so when you have these girls dancing like this, they don't know, they don't know who finds that attractive. They're not ready to handle that. They're not ready to handle what they're doing. And it's just to me, I I I'm deeply conservative kind of when it comes to I want to live in Meet Me in St. Louis. Meet Me in St. Louis was a it was a musical with Judy Garland. Uh respect, pills and booze, respect. And Meet Me in St. Louis, look at the house they lived in. I like these outfits that the people are in. That's the way people should dress. And they took trolleys. And the woman and the women cut. Look at these women. That's not unattractive. And look at the men. And the women look a little trans. And that's fine. <laughs> that was nice back then. Gender was more fluid then than it is now. You keep injecting collagen into your pussy lips to make yourself look... These people were cut. Look at that one on the left. She's kind of like, who knows what's going on there? But it's fun. And they dance. Look at the people used to dance with top hats and canes. Go up there to the left. Look at the way people used to live. What year was this? 1944. 1944. Not everything going on in 1944 was spectacular. It's an unfortunate year for this to have been made. I'm in a little bit of a hole now. Okay? What I'm saying is that I don't like anything about 1944 except this film. I didn't know when it was made when I went into this. I don't prepare for this fucking show. There was a lot going on in 1944 that I have a big problem with. But people taking trolleys in St. Louis and dancing with hats is not one of them. Christ, it had to be made in 1944. Now it sounds like a dog whistle. I'm going to have to deal with that Daily Show writer again. She did have yourself, a, you know, have yourself a Merry Little Christmas. Mm -hmm. This was the famous song that came from Meet Me in St. Louis. Oh. My, my grandmother used to watch this. And then clang, clang, clang went the trolley. Did you ever listen to that? No, I didn't. Clang, clang, clang with the trolley. Ding, ding, ding with the bell. Whatever is going on in Germany is their business. <laughs> now, that lyric was changed. Clang, clang, clang with the trolley. <laughs> ding, ding, ding with the bell. Let's not ask too many questions. Stocks are up. Things are going well. But this was a this was a fun. I mean, this was fun here. Did you see this? Did you watch the classics? I've never seen this. Never seen this. This was a great fucking man. Have yourself a merry little have yourself a merry little Christmas. Take the Vicodin, booze and pills and love. You know that was Judy Garland. She, towards the end, it was rough, but she was a fucking icon. She had that voice. She was in the Wizard of Oz. Yes, and she had that voice. She had that amazing voice that nobody had. You know that. Remember that. Keeping up with the Kardashians is ending. Let's pull that up. Keeping up with the Kardashians is ending, folks. And it is one of the most influential shows of the last 25 years. It is the blueprint for modern American fame, 100%. Okay? It replaced talent with access. And this point is uh, something that we, we've seen over and over again. Access. <laughs> Caitlyn Jenner, nobody called you. Bitch, no one's calling you. Caitlin, Caitlin is like the, the most hilarious, problematic trans woman ever. I know. She's so great. She's like, nobody called me. I was at a Trump rally. I had service. <laughs> it's like, Caitlin, no one's calling. You're out of control, Caitlin. Caitlin's like, <laughs> I'm on tour with Candace Owens and no one called me. I don't get it. I heard it on the news. Why can't one of the kids that I have that might be O.J. Simpson's call me? 
But this is what this is what American fame has become. It's access. You sell access to yourself. And the cooler life you have, the more people want access to it, right? So if you live in Calabasas and you're rich and you have celebrity friends, people really want access to that. Or if you're a TikToker and you live in one of those houses, people want access to that. But they don't care about talent. You do. You care about talent. But the others don't. Um, we're talking about mass marketing here and the way that it's done. People want in. They want in. They want to see behind the curtain, behind the veil. They want to feel like they're sitting in your living room. They want to watch you eat uh, Cheerios. This is what has been happening over the last, you know, two decades in this country. We have replaced talent. The things like Judy Garland had, which is this one in a million voice that was really never replicated, that just rolled out of her mouth like this crazy fucking, you know, when you hear her do Somewhere Over the Rainbow or you hear her do Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas, it wasn't, a, it, it was, it was, it wasn't even remarkably powerful. She wasn't really, uh, you know, she didn't belt. She belted out a little, but nothing compared to like Whitney Houston or somebody like that. But it was just this voice. That, it, it, it wasn't from training. It wasn't really from, it, it was just there. It was this thing inside of her that just came out. It was this gift, whatever you want to call it. It was like from some other fucking celestial realm when she was really hitting that. We're not interested in that anymore. In, this, in fact, we think that's weird. We kind of don't like that. We kind of don't like when someone has an unexplainable, amazing talent because we don't know how we're going to do it. We don't know how we fit into that. Well, I got a wacky family and maybe one day, you know, there's always this weird idea that you're vicariously living through all these people that you watch on TV and you think there's a possibility that you might become them. And, and there's just no way to do that when you have somebody that has this incredibly rare talent that really isn't, I'm, I'm sure Judy Garland worked hard, but let's be very honest, that's a very natural kind of talent, it's a very kind of masculine Husky voice, like what? Go, go to. Uh, can we even play any of this? Uh, you want to play music? I want to play. Uh, have yourself a merry little Christmas. Yeah, I'd probably get pulled. Get pulled, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, Spotify, your move. Write the check. Daddy'll dance right over. You write that check. But what I'm saying is that the Kardashians are the are the blueprint for being famous now. So with AOC is a Kardashian. Yeah. yeah. The Hype House and the Sway House are Kardashians. Mm -hmm. All the major political figures now will be Kardashians. Donald Trump's a Kardashian. Don't get it twisted. Everything that's succeeding right now in, in a very big way are, are Kardashians. They, they're, those are people that give you... It's an all-access pass to their thoughts and their lives. No matter how humdrum and unimportant something they may be doing is, they'll do it and they'll let you in on it. And that, and you get the access pass. You all access pass all day, every day. You can sit there and have a ringside seat for uh, their life. And again, the cooler the life is or the more uh, sensational it is, the more people want in. And that's what the Kardashians did. That's really what the Kardashians did. It's, it's, it's really amazing to watch uh, a show like this come to an end because you don't know what's next, you know? One of the kids from uh, one of the guys from Chapo Trap House after Trump won, I think he said, but the really scary thing is you could, like, what is next? Right. You can't imagine what's next. I can't imagine what is next after the Kardashian, you know? I can't imagine how it could get less talent focused. Truly. And I like them, by the way. I've defended them. I like them. I think they're hard workers. Like Kim Kardashian's a beast and a business person. And, there, and there's no, uh, I have nothing negative to say about them. Other than the um, celebration of that particular type of show um, and that particular type of route to fame is says a lot about the wholesale destruction of the American culture. That, But that's the only negative thing I'd say. <laughs> Truly. And if you know me, you know I could say a lot of negative things. The only negative thing that I would say is that it's the wholesale destruction of any beauty in American culture. But other than that, truly, truly other than that, I kind of respect the hustle. Yeah. Here's what America is. I said this on the Segura pod, but it's not coming out till the week before the election. So here's what it is. If I had to explain America to somebody, America is 
hearing a song on the radio and then somebody tells you that song is Bad Baby and you go, who's Bad Baby? And they go, it's the woman who said, catch me outside, how about that? The woman who's threatening to fight the audience and her own mother on Dr. Phil. And there's a moment of rage that builds up in you that this woman is now a star. But then a split second later, you start bobbing your head to the beat and you go, this isn't that bad. This isn't that bad. America is the moment between the rage and going, this is pretty good. That's where America lives. Never forget that. So as angry as I may seem or as hateful as some of my rhetoric appears, a minute later, I'll just go, pretty good. Because I'm a survivor and that's how you survive in America. That's how you don't go insane. That's how you don't go insane. Because otherwise you just go insane. You bang your head against a wall until you see blood. You know? Just that moment of, I can't believe this fucking bitch. I don't know about these hoes. Just a moment. This, she's a fucking, so why Porsche? Why Jays? Why? Oh! Well, this isn't that bad at all. That's America. And that's the way I feel about the Kardec. Because for, for a moment, I get a little angry that the beauty of American culture, any of it, has been completely and totally destroyed to never return. That bothers me a little bit. It's not the worst show. <laughs> Goodbye.